It can be so easy for us at this time of year when we're celebrating Easter to not always take a closer look at what happened, those moments just before Jesus got to the cross and what he actually did when he hung on the cross. Today, join me as we take a closer look at those moments and see just how amazing it is to know a God who fills the gaps, not only in the lives of those at the cross, but in our lives too. I can remember a time when my auntie rang me and she was inviting me to actually speak somewhere, but it was for the occasion of Mother's Day. And when she was on the phone with me, we began to have this conversation. And then she paused and said, oh, maybe I shouldn't be getting you to preach today. Is it gonna be too hard? With the topic being Mother's Day. And I thought about it because the truth is when I was a teenager, my parents' marriage ended and my mum left. And so she wasn't on the scene so much anymore. But the more I thought about it, the more I actually realized how blessed I am. I thought of those amazing women who've stood in the gap at different times in my life. I can remember when I first found out about my parents separating and an auntie or two aunties who weren't actually biological aunties, but women who'd come into my life and who had become aunties to me stood there and they said, we are here for you. You have a home with us. No matter what happens, we're still here. And that made such a difference in my life. And then I thought about the woman who had come along and even though she was going through her own traumatic experiences at the time, she also stood in the gap, put her arms around me and said that I was welcome at any time. Today, she is the woman I actually refer to as mum. I can recount story after story about how these amazing women have come along and stood in the gap. And then I thought, I can actually speak to this. I can actually speak to this more than ever before because women who stood up in my life have filled that space and I know without a doubt that it is God who is the one who put them in my life. It's so evident when we look at the Bible that we can learn real quick that God is a master of filling gaps. I've not only seen this in my own life, but I've seen it in the lives of so many others as well. And even when we look at the story of Jesus himself, we can see how when Jesus walked on this earth and he crossed paths with so many people, those who needed healing, those who needed to be made whole, those who needed to be restored. He was constantly filling the gaps in their lives. There are so many powerful stories. And today we're revisiting one of those stories and it's actually probably the most powerful story in all of the gospel. So what we've seen so far is that we've seen Jesus being welcomed into Jerusalem as the triumphant entry. He's welcomed as a king. They roll out the red carpet. He's riding a colt and people are laying their garments and their palm branches before him. They're yelling out, Hosanna in the highest. They're referring to him as the king, the deliverer, the one who's come to save them. It's so powerful and so amazing. And then what we see happen so quickly in the days that unfold is that this celebration spirals to becoming just the opposite. Very quickly, Jesus is spending some intimate time with those closest to him, with his disciples, and they're sitting in the upper room and he does this beautiful act of service when he washes the disciples' feet. Then he shares a meal with them, which we know as the Last Supper. And at this very table, he acknowledges that one of his very own, one of those closest to him, is actually going to betray him. He then spends an intimate moment in the Garden of Gethsemane when he cries his heart out to God. And he actually hands his will over and takes up the will of the Father and continues in his mission to save you and me. Even though when he returns from his prayer time, he finds his disciples sleeping when he had asked for them to pray for him, he still journeys with them. And in the very next moment, he's arrested. He's taken before rulers. 
He's been accused of the most horrible crime, of lying when he says that he is the King of Kings. Next minute, what we see is that he's brought before the people and the people choose that they are to wash their hands of him and the decision is made that he will be crucified as a criminal. When Jesus is arrested and just before he carries the cross, we actually hear about him being whipped and beaten. Now we may hear this term being whipped and I know when I grew up in school, we used to have a school strap once upon a time. Well, this is nothing like this. This is actually a whip that had multiple ends to it and they all had a hook. And so when they would hit your body, they would catch in the flesh and they would drag it out. So you can imagine the brutal beating that Jesus faced, but he still had his eyes focused. He had his eyes focused on the mission. He knew what was to come and he chose to stay there anyway. I cannot even imagine what it was like for him that moment he had to pick up the cross and he had to carry it through the people. Did he even take note of what the cedar wood smelt like? Did he feel the true weight of the cross? Or was it the weight of something else he knew that he was carrying? Did he feel the people poking and prodding him as he walked through the crowd, as he was laid down, laden with this cross, making him buckle over? Did he even notice? Did he feel splinters going into his skin from this cross? I can't even imagine what it was like for him, but he chose to stay there and he chose to keep walking. When only days earlier, about a week earlier, he had had the carpet rolled out for him, a red carpet, and he was treated as a king. Now he was treated as a criminal. Now people didn't lay down their palm branches, but they laid out words of accusation. They poked and prodded him, they jeered at him, they even spat on him. This was once the one they claimed as king, and now he was a criminal. Now the way that the crucifixion happened, it didn't de differ depending on who it was. It was the same for everyone. So he would have been walking through this crowd with in between four soldiers and one in front would have been carrying a sign that declared the accusation. It declared his crime. And Jesus' sign said, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. This was the crime that he was accused of being Jesus, the King of the Jews, can you even believe that this was considered a crime? But those who were putting him in this place, those who were sure that they wanted this to be his end, they knew that this was the only way that they could reclaim their power, that they could ma maintain their position in society. And so the very thing he was accused of is the very thing that is so true, because he was Jesus and he was the king of the Jews. They also ensured that they took the longest route possible to Calvary. They wanted everyone to see what he was being accused of. They wanted everyone to have an opportunity to witness that he was, by their law, a criminal. It's at this point that Simon from Cyrene is forced to carry the cross because Jesus no longer has the physical strength to carry it himself. George Knight puts it like this. In Jewish understanding, anyone executed by crucifixion was rejected by his people, cursed by the law of God, and excluded from God's covenant with the Jewish people. So when they finally reached Calvary, the place of crucifixion, this wooden cross was laid flat on the ground. Jesus was laid on top of it, and the nails were pierced through his hands. His feet were then loosely tied, and in between his legs there was a piece of wood that acted like a saddle. Now this had a purpose. It meant when they put the cross up, the weight of his body wouldn't cause the nails to tear through his hand. But he could hang on the cross for as long as possible and experience the true depth of the pain that those nails were causing in his hand. Can you even imagine what that was like? them actually picking the cross up and the sud of it sloshing into the hole that was already there in the ground. This heavy cross and then his weight 
taking hold and pulling on those nails. But it didn't pull him to release him so he could be freed. It pulled him so he could stay in that position and experience that pain. But at that moment, he wasn't thinking about the physical pain that he was going through. He was thinking about the pain he felt in his heart. His mission was to come and rescue us from any pain that we are experiencing, any pain that they were experiencing at that moment. Even though they didn't know it, he was right where he needed to be. Well, here we have Jesus on top of the hill at Calvary. He's in excruciating pain. He has nails pierced through his wrists and people there are still jeering and calling him names. They're yelling out, you can save others, but you can't even save yourself. If you're really Jesus, why don't you come down off the cross? Well, in that moment with his arms stretched out, he was filling a gap. He was filling the gap between heaven and earth. This was the whole reason why he had come. Sin had separated humanity from God in the very beginning. But now as he hung on that cross, he decided or he knew that his whole mission was to reunite the creator with those that he had created. He hung in that gap as a gap filler. It's such a beautiful picture at the same time as it's such a heart-wrenching picture. And as he looked out, he wasn't looking at the view. He was looking at those he himself had created. He was there for them. For the soldiers who had driven the nails through his hands, he was there for them. For those who were jeering at him and spitting on him, he was there for, for them. And no matter what, it didn't deter him from his mission. But his eyes weren't on the view, just looking out at the beautiful scenery around him. His eyes were on those who were before him, those who were at his feet. There was nothing that Jesus wasn't prepared to do in order to save humanity. We need to remember that Jesus is God. Jesus was powerful. He was there because he wanted to be there. He wasn't forced to be there at this time. In the book of John, it tells us, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So Jesus chose to be there, hanging on a cross between two other criminals, as if that was his rightful place as a criminal, when in fact that was his rightful place as our Saviour, choosing to be there at this moment in time. And his focus shifts. His focus moves towards his feet. And when we look down at his feet, we see some very important woman there. We see his mother, Mary, there because she could not be anywhere else. She was his mother. We also see some other woman there. And it tells us in John chapter 19, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Can you imagine what that moment was like for Mary? The mother who had been there for him and with him since the beginning, since conception by the Holy Spirit. She had seen him at birth. She had seen him taking his first step. She had even witnessed his first miracle. And now she was there watching her son in the flesh on the cross. At the same time, she was watching her saviour on the cross. It's such a significant moment when Jesus is so aware that she's about to lose a son. So what did he do for her? He steps in and he fills the gap. He says to the disciple whom he loved, here is your mother. Now this is so important in the culture of the day. We know that her husband was no longer around. So for her livelihood to continue, for her to be taken care of, she needs a male in her life who can do that. 
She is the gift that Jesus gives to John also though. She is the one that there to fill the gap of Jesus whom he had walked with, someone there to nurture him, someone there to lead and guide him. He fills the gap in both their lives. To Mary, he gives a son, and to John, he gives a mother. Now at the same time as this is happening, Jesus is on the cross as both their savior. What an amazing thing to witness. Not only that Jesus fills the physical gaps in our lives, but he is also there as someone who fills the spiritual gaps in our lives. One author puts it like this, Maybe Mary could not understand, but Mary could love. Her presence there was the most natural thing in the world for a mother. What a beautiful thing. It was the most natural thing in the world for Mary to be there as a mother. I can only imagine also the most painful thing for Mary to be there as a mother and to watch her son suffer in this way. The author also goes on to say, the eternal love of the heart of motherhood is in Mary at the cross. We can just see a mother's heart here that she sticks with him through thick and thin. He could have gone through anything in that moment and it would not have deterred this mother from being there at the foot of the cross. We have so much we can learn from this moment on the cross. And the first thing I really want us to see is that at this moment, we see the most beautiful and powerful picture of grace. Jesus is here at this moment. They are covering us with grace. He is there on the cross covering our sin. It is at this moment that he takes our sin from us and he actually clothes himself in our sin. And in response to this, we are able to take up his garment of grace and we are completely covered with grace. We are made right with God because Jesus, who was without sin, took our place on the cross. This is something that can be so challenging for many of us to wrestle with and truly understand in life. We can find it hard to accept that a God, the God of the universe, could choose to love us and completely forgive us. It's almost like that moment that we hear about is grace. It's too overwhelming. So we only think we're worth part of that grace. So we'll take that grace, but we still beat ourselves up with our own memories of the past. We still beat ourselves up with the mistakes that we make every day, the bad habits we have. We're really good at beating ourselves up. But God reminds us in this moment that he covered us completely. He did it once and for all. In this moment, we can so clearly see that beautiful verse so often recited in scripture, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever believes in him, they are free from the debt of sin. They are free from death eternal and they get to put on and accept eternal life. This is grace, not partly grace that's only given to some people, but grace that we are all offered freely. We are invited into a relationship with him and it is in this relationship with him that we get to experience restoration. We are made whole again. Yes, our past is still there, but it's not for us to remember and beat ourselves up again and again. It's there for us to recognize God's grace, how good he is to us. When I look at who I was without Jesus and what Jesus has done for me in, his, in my life, I am overwhelmed and feel so loved. I feel so appreciated. I feel so whole in my own skin. I am who I am, and I, and I am loved by God, holy, truly, without restraint. And every day, he still pursues me with his love. Even on the days when I muck up, even on the days when I don't have it all together, his grace doesn't change. His love for me doesn't change. I cannot do anything, even on my worst day, 
to make him love me any less. And I cannot do anything, even on my best day, to make him love me any more. His love is unconditional. His grace that he poured out over me and continues to pour out over me is unconditional. And this is the beauty of the cross. This is where we find Jesus at this point, filling that gap for you and me. When he stays there on the cross and he pours out his unconditional, powerful grace. Jesus bridged the gap with his grace and he called us into adoption. In the book of Hebrews, it tells us, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Can you imagine that? Jesus, the Son of God, the one who was perfect, the one who was without sin, isn't ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. In other places in scripture, it goes on to say, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ. When we are baptized, we are clothed in Christ and heirs according to the promise. We are not left as orphans, but that Jesus will come to us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. So adoption is part of grace. Adoption is something that we get not because we deserve it, but because Jesus chose us and because Jesus clothes us in his grace and he calls us not only to walk beside him, but to become part of the family. Now, I know a little bit of what it's like to be outside of family. There was a time in my life when I found that I was the only one from my family left in the church. My walk with God was lonely, but I had those who stood with me those who gathered around me and they called me their own. The woman who I mentioned before who took me in as her own. She still calls me her big girl. She gives me the privilege of calling her mum. I have aunties, uncles, cousins, nieces and nephews who call me auntie that I have the privilege to call family, not by blood, but because they've adopted me into their family and I've adopted them into my family. When I think about inheritance, I think about lineage or our whakapapa. And when we look at where Jesus comes from, we know that he came out of the line of David. But what happens when it gets to the name of Jesus? Who comes from his name? Well, it's us, those who choose him. We become part of that line and we are adopted. We are invited into this heavenly relationship, which means we have a heavenly inheritance. So if we're adopted into God's family and we're part of the heavenly family, then it means we're also part of the family business. And when we're talking about Jesus, that's about calling others to know him too. And therefore we have a purpose. So hopefully you've clicked on to the fact of what it means for Jesus to fill the gap. It means we're covered by his grace, we're adopted into his family, and we have a heavenly purpose. In this world, we can have gifts and talents and we can use them in everyday life. And that's absolutely amazing. But once we meet Jesus, does our interaction with people change in our everyday life? Or maybe God's calling you to do something really specific right outside your comfort zone. That's definitely been my experience where God has trained me in the training ground even when I didn't know him. And then he's called me to a life with him and called me to a life of service for him. And then I've realized God had a purpose for me all along. Well, each of us are designed with a specific purpose, a heavenly purpose. God intends to do something amazing, something transformational, both in you and through you. Believe me when I say, God's not finished with you yet. Our world needs to experience love through the combination of the you and God. No one else can love in that combination, only you and Jesus. So wherever you're at today, you might be unemployed, seeking for a job. You might be in a job that you love, but you really wanna offer God more. You might be questioning how God can use you in your everyday life. Be encouraged 
be encouraged through the story of Jesus. His ministry best happened when he interacted with people in their everyday life. And that's a lesson that we can learn too. We are covered by his grace and that witnesses to others. We are adopted into his family, so we have a sense of belonging. We have ownership in what we do and the faith that we share. And we have a greater purpose, each of us, and we can all be part of what it means to love the world as only Jesus can, to invite people to know the Jesus that came and died on this cross, the Jesus that at this moment when he was on the top of the hill wasn't looking out at the scenery but looked at those who were at his feet. I'm actually really thankful for all the gaps in my life. If it wasn't for the gaps in my life, then I wouldn't have been able to experience the God that I've been able to experience. The one who stepped in and filled my needs every single time. I'm really good at trying to do things on my own, in my own strength. But here at the cross and here in my own life, what I've experienced is our God always fills the gap. So I want to ask you today, what gaps do you have in your life? Ask God to be the one to fill them. Do you realize that you're actually adopted into God's family? And what about purpose? Are you desiring to discover God's purpose that he has just for you? Let me pray with you now. Lord, we thank you so much for the beautiful gift you gave us in Jesus that he came to this world, lived in this world, breathed in this world, and chose to die just for us. We are saved, we are free, we are completely covered by your grace. We are called into adoption into your family, and you have a purpose over each one of our lives. Hear the prayers of our hearts, and bless us all for your glory, we pray in your mighty name. Amen. Amen.